I hope that you will be blessed today with the message from God. I always say this, but truly I ask you to keep your hearts and your minds open to God's message for you today. Though I may speak one word, it will be interpreted by many as God speaks to your own heart. And He wants to bless you. Can you imagine how many blessings we have missed over our lifetime? Uh, God wants to bless us, but we miss it because we push God away. That's not really what I want today. I'm looking for something else. I'm looking for a different answer. So we push God away and we stop Him from blessing us with what we need, truly need, and uh, we end up being the cause. Let's make an effort today to start just letting God be God in your life. Let God speak to your hearts. He does. Through your work, through His Word, through message, through love of others. So many ways God speaks to your heart. But when you hear it, obey it. Prepare yourself to say, I need to obey God when I hear from Him today. Whatever the message is, just obey. And your life will be, trust me, changed in ways you can't imagine today sitting in this church. When you start obeying God and His Word, you're going to be changed in ways that's going to knock you out. Now, a lot of times people come up to me and say, uh, you know, I don't understand it. I hate my life. I don't like the way things are and my life sucks. And I just, I don't understand it. And what's the secret? And I'm sure all of us have said that once in a, probably in our life. But the amazing thing is, uh, God says it right there in Revelation 3.20. He says, Behold, I stand at the door of your heart. I knock. And any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and will sup with him and he with me. God is standing there today. He says in Matthew, When two or more are gathered in my name, I'm there in the midst. We know God is with us today. We know God has a message for us today. God is standing at your heart knocking. Will you open it? Jesus is right there. He's extending love. He's extending His Word. He's extending the answer to those questions that we just heard. But what does man usually do? It's like when you walk across the carpet and you trip. And you, what's the first thing you do? You look up and see if anybody saw you. Know. Oops. So what do we do when we ask Him those questions? And God reaches down and says, here, i got something for you. A lot of times we push God away. No, that's not what I'm looking for. And that won't work. Surely that's not the answer. We start being control freaks that we are. But we must be in control in our lives and many times in our lives of others instead of stopping and praying and just letting God come into our hearts and work through us for His glory and our blessings. If that sounds like you, pay close attention because God has a gift with you, for you today. Because as humans, we do that, don't we? So many times in our life, we want to make the decision. We want to be in charge. And God's standing right there saying, I got something better for you. It's not until we stop, we obey, and open our hearts, will God speak to us so that, that we can hear Him and obey Him. If all who can stand, please stand with me for the reading of God's Word. We find it today in Matthew 10, 34 to 39. Think not that I am come to sin peace on earth. I came not to send peace but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father and a daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it. He that loses his life for my sake shall find it. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, your words today teach us how to lose our life for you. How to, to, as we lose it, we will find life. Teach us about your kingdom that is so upside down in comparison to this world. Show us this. Teach us this. Guide us. Illuminate. Transform our hearts to the way you want. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Now we've been focusing on this set of scriptures probably for the last month. We had a series of three or four sermons on disciples uh, and then the church's responsibility of disciple making. And uh, we're going to conclude today 
Um, but I wanted to bring into focus, especially verses 38 and 39. And he that taketh not his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it. He that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. By a show of hands, how many of you have ever worn a cross on your neck? How many of you have ever had a cross on, on a lapel or a sweater? How many of you got crosses in your house? I say almost everybody. The symbol of Christianity is the cross, and in some respects, rightfully, the cross is the hinge of all history. It is the centerpiece of all we believe and hold dear. But what does it really mean when Jesus says, He that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me? What does that mean to carry your cross? Now, I'm going to share some thoughts with you today that you may have never heard in church. Now, that's a bold statement because some of y'all have been in church for a long time, many years. But we hear sermons on carrying your cross, and a lot of times it's flowery language. It's a feel good. It feels so good to wear my cross. Jesus died for me on the cross. And we like that. We feel good about it. But what's the true meaning of it? When Jesus says, you're not worthy of me if you will not pick up your cross and carry it. What is God saying there? People of the day of Jesus knew exactly what it meant. It's hard for us sometimes to understand, isn't it? We don't have crucifixions these days, do we? We've never gone to a public crucifixion. The people of Jesus' day knew exactly what it meant. Carrying a cross was a fulfillment of a death sentence. The man who carried the cross had no way out. He was not covered with many friends, many family. He was alone. His life was over. He was about to suffer the most humiliating and extremely painful execution ever devised by man. He was truly a dead man walking. We are unworthy of Jesus when we resist our own death to self. Say that again. We are unworthy of Jesus when we resist our own death to self. He was willing to give his life for us on the cross and pay and redeem us for our sins. And unless we're willing to return the favor, we do not wear the mantle of his sacrifice appropriately. The odd thing is that it's our view of life that is twisted. The Bible makes it clear that the one who has faith in Jesus has already passed from death to life, from darkness to light. We know Jesus says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Hebrews 13, 6 says, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear what man shall do to me. But again, we see in Matthew 10, 39, he who has found life will lose it, he who has lost his life for my sake will find. And like many of you, and many in the world, what's that mean? Why is death so important? We read about it in the Bible all the time. But have you ever wondered that? Why is death so important? Consider this, without death, you have no resurrection. Without death, there'd be no gospel or salvation, or even life itself. We need to learn to understand the theology of death. In our world, we are built from infants to mature to protect ourselves, keep ourselves safe, provide for ourselves the best we can. Avoid sickness and death. Don't do anything that could jeopardize you. We're in, we want to be protected in our cocoon, especially in this country. But we need to understand what a theology of death truly means. D, die daily to who we are. In your uh, inserts, I've printed this on the bottom for you to follow. E, empowering others, not self, is our life. A, accept risk as normative. Theology, T, is not just knowledge but practice. Hold tight to Christ and loosely to everything else. Amen. Unless we're willing to die, we will never live. I can't think of a more tragic life than a life unlived. 